Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the North American Vascular Biology Organization's fifth webinar. I am Anar Cuervo from the University of Illinois College of Medicine, and I will be moderating today's session. We are pleased to welcome our speaker, Michael Dellinger from UT Southwestern Medical Center, who will present his work entitled Lymphatic Vessels and Vanishing Bones, Animal Models of Lymphatic Anomalies with Bone, with bone Involvement. We are presenting a webinar in lymphatic biology today because of feedback from attendees of earlier webinars. So please share your feedback in the evaluation form so that we can best or organize future webinars. Today's webinar is being sponsored by the Lymphatic Malformation Institute and the LGDA. Before we get started, I want to go over some logistical aspects. Throughout this webinar, you are able to switch between the phone audio and the computer audio in case you're having a problem. You can see this information in the audio section of the GoToWebinar control panel. If you experience technical problems, please click on the Help tab at the top of the control plan panel. Scroll to the bottom of the help screen for ten technical support phone number. At this time, I'd also like to welcome Devon Hominick, also from the UT Southwestern, who will monitor today's questions. Questions will be handled in two ways. Throughout the presentation, you can type your questions into the question box in the, in the control panel. These questions will then be answered at the end of the presentation, so Dr. Hominick will compile and pose the questions to Dr. Dellinger. At the end of the question and answer period, provided that there's time, attendees will be able to also ask additional questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand by clicking in the hand icon on the left side of your control panel. You will be then recognized by me, and we will unmute your phone, uh, your microphone, and then you will be able to ask your question live. This webinar is being recorded and archived at the NABO website for future use. So we're hearing today from Dr. Dellinger. Dellinger. Dr. Dellinger is an assistant professor in the Department of Surgery at UT Southwestern Medical Center. He is also a member of the Hammond Center for Regenerative Science and Medicine and is the director of research for the Lymphatic Malformation Institute. His lab is focused on identifying the causes of rare lymphatic diseases and therapies for these devastating diseases. Please welcome Dr. Dellinger. Thank you, Hanar, for the introduction. Lymphatic anomalies are disabling, disfiguring, and sometimes deadly diseases. Unfortunately, the etiology of these diseases is poorly understood. This gap in knowledge has made it difficult to treat patients and to develop animal models of these diseases. We believe that animal models of lymphatic anomalies would be useful because they could be used to identify effective therapies for these devastating diseases. And today I'm gonna to present research from my lab, which has been focused on developing and characterizing animal models of lymphatic anomalies that affect bone. Before I present the research that we've been doing in the lab, I just want to briefly introduce the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system encompasses lymph, lymphocytes, lymphoid organs such as lymph nodes, and a network of vessels. And these vessels are found in most regions of the body. However, a few tissues such as bone lack lymphatic vessels. Lymphatic vessels serve several important physiological functions. Lymphatic vessels are involved in the immune response, they absorb and transport fat, and they return fluid and macromolecules to the blood vascular system. And there are two distinct types of vessels which work together to carry out these physiological functions. The lymphatic network begins with initial lymphatics. These vessels are also called lymphatic capillaries. And you can see in the background image as well as in the illustration, that initial lymphatics form a highly branched, two-dimensional, blind-ended network. Initial lymphatic vessels are the absorbing vessels of the lymphatic system. These vessels pick up fluid and macromolecules from the interstitium and then transport this fluid as lymph to the second type of lymphatic known as a collecting lymphatic. Collecting lymphatic vessels are surrounded by a layer of smooth muscle cells and they contain intraluminal valves which partition the vessel into discrete contractile elements called lymphangions. The pumping of lymphangions 
propels lymph to lymph nodes, and ultimately to the thoracic duct, which empties into the left subclavian vein. The differences between initial and collecting lymphatics arise during embryonic and postnatal development. This slide summarizes the current model for the development of the mammalian lymphatic system. During embryonic development, a subset of blood endothelial cells begin to express the transcription factor PROX1 that causes these endothelial cells to differentiate into lymphatic endothelial cells. These newly formed lymphatic endothelial cells then migrate away from blood vessels and reorganize to form sacs. And in the mouse embryo, six lymph sacs form in different regions of the body. Sprouts emerge from these sacs and form a primitive plexus of vessels. Isolated lymphatic endothelial cells called lymphangioblasts also contribute to the formation of this primitive network of lymphatics. Later in development, a subset of vessels mature into collecting lymphatics. So these lymphatics recruit smooth muscle cells and they develop valves. So at the end of development, a hierarchical network is present comprised of initial and collecting lymphatic vessels. Lymphatic diseases arise when there are defects in the development of the lymphatic system. And the lymphatic disease that we're gonna focus on today is called Gorham-Stout disease. Gorham-Stout disease is a lymphatic disease that's characterized by the de development of lymphatics in bone and by massive bone loss. This disease is a sporadic disease. It's not inherited. We think that it's caused by a somatic genetic mutation. However, the genetic mutations that cause this disease have not been identified. This disease can present at any age, but is typically diagnosed in children and young adults. Gorham-Stout disease affects both males and females equally. This disease can be restricted to a single bone. However, it typically involves multiple bones. And when multiple bones are affected, they are usually contiguous bones or bones that are next to one another. The course of Gorham-Stout disease is unpredictable. In some patients, the osteolytic process occurs slowly over a period of years, whereas in other patients it occurs rapidly over a period of months. One very interesting feature of this disease is that it will spontaneously arrest after a period of activity. So when a patient is initially diagnosed with Gorham-Stout disease, it's not known if their disease is in an active or inactive state, and there are currently no biomarkers to help make that distinction. Importantly, there's no evidence of new bone formation after the disease arrests. Once the bone disappears, it does not regenerate. It is gone for good. This disease can affect any bone in the body, but it typically affects the ribs and vertebrae. And th thoracic involvement is associated with a poor prognosis because these patients tend to develop chylothorax, which can cause respiratory distress, failure, and death. Although the field of Gorham-Stout disease research hasn't significantly advanced over the past 50 years, substantial progress has been made in the field of lymphangiogenesis research. And over the past 20 years, VEGFC has emerged as the principal driver of lymphangiogenesis. VEGFC is a growth factor that activates the receptor tyrosine kinases, VEGFR2 and VEGFR3. Both of these receptors are expressed by lymphatic endothelial cells, and both stimulate the formation of new lymphatics, a process called lymphangiogenesis. Loss of function studies have revealed that VEGFC plays a critical role in the development of the lymphatic vasculature. Mice that lack a single copy of VEGFC develop fewer lymphatic vessels than wild-type mice. And mice that lack both copies of VEGFC do not develop lymphatics at all. Conversely, overexpression of VEGFC has been shown to stimulate lymphangiogenesis. So overexpression of VEGFC in the pancreas has been shown to stimulate the formation of lymphatics in the pancreas. Overexpression of VEGFC in the lung stimulates lymphangiogenesis in the lung. Overexpression of VEGFC in tumors stimulates lymphangiogenesis in tumors. So based on these observations, 
we hypothesized overexpression of VEGFC in bone would stimulate the formation of lymphatics in bone and bone loss. To test this hypothesis, we've created mice that overexpress VEGFC in osteocytes, chondrocytes, and osteoblasts. We have used the TET-OFF system to spatially and temporally control the expression of VEGFC. In our system, the Osterix promoter drives the expression of a tetracycline transactivator. When doxycycline is absent, the tetracycline transactivator induces the expression of VEGFC. When doxycycline is present, it binds to the tetracycline transactivator and prevents the expression of VEGFC. And we introduce doxycycline to our mice by putting it in their drinking water. So mice that are on normal drinking water express VEGFC in bone, whereas mice that receive doxycycline containing drinking water do not express VEGFC in bone. So we had found if we express VEGFC in bone during embryonic development, it caused the embryos to die. So to overcome this lethal phenotype, we generated mice where we inhibited the expression of VEGFC during embryonic development and then induced its expression during postnatal development. And what I'm showing here are sections of tibia that have been stained with an anti-LIV1 antibody. And LIV1 is a marker of lymphatic endothelium. You can see in the control mouse, there are no lymphatic vessels in the bone. In contrast, in the double uh, transgenic mouse, the bone is filled with lymphatic vessels. So these data show that overexpression of VEGFC in bone is sufficient to stimulate the formation of lymphatics in bone. We then set out to characterize the development of bone lymphatics in our double transgenic mice. And we analyzed three different areas of bone. <clears throat> we focused on the periosteum, which is the connective tissue that covers the bone, cortical bone, which is a hard, dense outer shell of bone, and trabecular bone, which is a honeycomb-like network of bone found within bones. And I just want to briefly go over the method we use to quantify lymphatic vessels. What we do is we take a picture of lymphatics, we then place a grid over that picture, and then count the number of times the grid lines intersect either uh, within or on a lymphatic vessel. And we refer to this as our lymphatic vessel index. So you'll hear me refer to lymphatic vessel index multiple times throughout this presentation. So we found that lymphatic vessels were restricted to the periosteum in bones from 21-day-old mice. Lymphatic vessels were in the periosteum and cortical bone in uh, bones from double transgenic 28-day-old mice. And we saw bones in the periosteum, or lymphatics in the periosteum, cortical bone, and bone marrow in bones from 35-day-old double transgenic mice. So these results suggest that bone lymphatics develop through an outside-in mechanism. Like I said before, VEGFC stimulates the activation of VEGFR2 and VEGFR3, and both of these receptors can stimulate lymphangiogenesis. We then set out to determine whether VEGFR3 or VEGFR2 activity was required for the development of bone lymphatics in our double transgenic mice. To do that, we treated mice with either DC-101 or MF431C1. DC-101 is a monoclonal antibody that blocks VEGFR2, whereas MF431C1 is a monoclonal antibody that blocks VEGFR3. We found that bones from saline and DC-101 treated animals were filled with lymphatic vessels. In contrast, bones from MF431C1 treated animals did not contain lymphatic vessels, and they appeared completely normal. So these data show that VEGFR3 signaling is required for the development of bone lymphatics in our mutant mice. We then set out to characterize the effect of VEGFC expression on bone structure. What we're looking at here are micro CT images of femurs and ribs from single and double transgenic mice. And what we found was that the cortical bone was from double transgenic mice was significantly more porous than the cortical bone in our single transgenic animals. So these data show that expression of VEGFC in bone 
can induce bone loss. We then wanted to determine whether these structural defects caused functional defects. To do that, we performed a three-point bending assay. This is an assay where force is applied to bones until the bones break. And what we found was significantly less force was required to break the bones from double transgenic mice than the single transgenic mice. So these data show that bones from our double transgenic animals are weaker than the bones from our single transgenic mice. We then set out to determine the mechanism of bone loss in our double transgenic animals. Bone mass is regulated by the activity of two different cell types. Osteoclasts are large multinucleated cells that resorb bone, and osteoblasts are cuboidal cells that synthesize bone. There are several case reports that suggest that osteoclasts promote bone resorption in Gorham Stout disease, so we focused our attention on osteoclasts in our animal model. We first performed a trap stain, and this is a special stain that marks osteoclasts in either red or pink. And we found that there were significantly more osteoclasts in our double transgenic animals than the single transgenic animals. To support this finding, we also measured the circulating levels of CTX1. CTX1 is a fragment of collagen 1 that's created by osteoclasts when they degrade bone. And this is frequently used as a circulating marker of osteoclast activity. And we found that the circulating level of CTX1 was higher in our double transgenic mice than the single transgenic mice. These data show that our double transgenic mice have more osteoclasts and these osteoclasts are active. We then set out to determine whether osteoclasts were responsible for destroying bone in our double transgenic mice. To do that, we treated our animals with soldronic acid, which is also called Zometa. And this is a drug that inhibits osteoclasts. We found that zoldronic acid did not affect the development of lymphatics in our double transgenic mice. However, our zoldronic acid treated animals had fewer osteoclasts than vehicle treated animals, and bones from zoldronic acid treated mice were less porous than bones from vehicle treated animals. These results show that bone loss in our double transgenic mice is mediated in part by osteoclasts. So to just summarize this first part of what I've shown so far, normal bones do not have lymphatic vessels. However, expression of VEGFC by osteocytes, osteoblasts, and chondrocytes stimulates the formation of lymphatics in bone. We also see that our double transgenic mice have more osteoclasts in bone, and that osteoclasts are responsible for destroying bone in our double transgenic mice. And we can attenuate bone loss in our mice by treating them with zoldronic acid. So overexpression of VEGFC in bone stimulates intraosseous lymphangiogenesis and osteolysis. And these are two pathologic hallmarks of Gorham Stout disease. We then set out to characterize the reversibility of the mutant phenotype of our mice. And there's reason to believe that the lymphatic phenotype of our mice would not be reversible. And that's because there's growing evidence that shows that lymphatic vessels do not regress following the withdrawal of a growth promoting stimulus. So an example of that is shown here. And what we're looking at are lymphatics in the trachea. And under baseline, you can see there's a regular lymphatic network. When VEGFC is expressed for seven days, this network grows. And what's amazing is that this irregular network of lymphatics persists even after the withdrawal of VEGFC. And you can see even after VEGFC has been inhibited for 19 months, these irregular lymphatic vessels persist. So we hypothesized actually that the lymphatics in our mice would persist following the withdrawal of VEGFC and the phenotype of our mice would not be reversible. But before we characterize the histology of our mice, we first wanted to examine the reversibility of VEGFC expression in bone. 
And in this experiment, we generated mice where we induced the expression of VEGFC for 35 days. We then placed mice back on doxycycline water for either three days or seven days. And we isolated RNA from tibias and measured VEGFC mRNA levels by qPCR. And we found that VEGFC mRNA levels returned to normal uh, as soon as three days after being treated with the doxycycline. So these data show that doxycycline rapidly inhibits the expression of VEGFC in our double transgenic mice. We then performed a longer experiment where we induced the expression of VEGFC for 35 days, and then we inhibited its expression for either 28 or 56 days. And what we're looking at here are longitudinal sections of rib. And these ribs have been stained with an antibody that detects podoplanin, another marker of lymphatic endothelium. And you can see in the single transgenic animal, there are no lymphatic vessels in the bone, and there are a few lymphatics in the adjacent muscle. Overexpression of VEGFC for 35 days induced the formation of lymphatics in bone. It also induced the growth of lymphatics in the adjacent muscle. To our surprise, the abnormal lymphatic vessels in the bone, but not the abnormal lymphatics in the muscle, disappeared following the withdrawal of VEGFC. So these data show that lymphatics in bone depend on continued VEGFC signaling for their survival. One possible explanation for this is that bones lack lymphatic maintenance factors. Bones do not normally have lymphatics, therefore bones would not need all of the uh, molecular machinery required to maintain a lymphatic network. An alternative explanation for this finding is that bones have inhibitory factors whose effects can be overcome by overexpressing VEGFC. And we're currently working on distinguishing between those two possibilities. This is just the quantification of the slides from that experiment, where we can see that bones from double transgenic animals have a high number of lymphatic vessels, and these lymphatic vessels disappear in the bone following withdrawal of VEGFC, but the lymphatic vessels persist in the muscle following the withdrawal of VEGFC. We then characterized the reversibility of the bone phenotype of our mice. We found that bones switch from having a moth-eaten appearance to having a normal appearance following the withdrawal of VEGFC. In addition to taking x-rays of the mice, we also examined the histology of bones. And we found that bones became less porous following the withdrawal of VEGFC. So our double transgenic mice that express VEGFC have very porous bones. And when we withdraw VEGFC, these pores are lost and the bone appears normal. We also found that the number of osteoclasts returned to normal and the circulating levels of CTX1 returned to normal following the withdrawal of VEGFC. The CTX1 finding caught our attention because we see that mice with active disease have a high level of CTX1, whereas mice with inactive disease have a low level of CTX1. So we think that CTX1 could potentially function as a circulating biomarker of disease activity. And we've begun to ex explore that hypothesis with patient samples. And what I'm showing is part of a collaboration with Denise Adams at Boston Children's Hospital and Tim LaCroix at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. And Denise had a phase two clinical trial where she treated patients with complicated lymphatic anomalies with rapamycin. And before patients were treated with rapamycin, their blood was taken for baseline values. And their blood was also taken six and 12 months after they were on rapamycin. And what we have found is that as, their, as patients' disease improves, the level of CTX1 goes down. So these data are preliminary, but I think very promising and we're working on obtaining more samples from patients so we can determine whether CTX1 could be a, a functional or useful biomarker of disease activity in patients. So to summarize this part of the talk, 
We have found that overexpression of VEGFC in bone causes a phenotype that resembles Gorham's stout disease. Our double transgenic mice have lymphatics in their bone. They have, they have, they have thin mice also develop calothorax. We have found that VEGFR3, not VEGFR2, activity is required for the formation of lymphatic vessels in our double transgenic mice. We have shown that bone loss is mediated in part by osteoclasts. And we have found that the phenotype of our double transgenic mice is at least partially reversible. Uh, the lymphatic vessels in the bone disappear and the bones go back to looking normal. However, our double transgenic mice still have irregular lymphatics in their adjacent soft tissue. So based on the similarities between our double transgenic mice and patients with gorham stout disease, we believe that our double transgenic mice can serve as a model for gorham stout disease. I'm now gonna spend the remainder of my time talking about a new unpublished story, which is focused on a related lymphatic anomaly called generalized lymphatic anomaly. So several years ago, Boston Children's Hospital was analyzing their Gorham Stout disease patient population. And they noticed that this population was comprised of two groups. There were some patients whose cortical bone was destroyed, and there were other patients whose cortical bone was spared. The patients whose cortical bones were destroyed kept the name Gorham Stout disease, whereas patients whose cortical bone was spared were renamed as having generalized lymphatic anomaly. So generalized lymphatic anomaly is very similar to Gorham Stout disease. These patients will have irregular lymphatics in their soft tissue, and they will also have lymphatics in bone and exhibit these bone lesions. The big difference between generalized lymphatic anomaly, or GLA, and Gorham Stout disease is the pattern of bone loss. So patients with Gorham Stout disease will have bones that will completely disappear whereas patients with GLA, their bones will not completely disappear. So just like uh, Gorham Stout disease, GLA is a sporadic disease. And we think that it's caused by a somatic mutation. So a mutation that is not inherited, is not present in sperm or egg, but it's a mutation that randomly occurs during development. So to test the hypothesis, that GLA is caused by a somatic mutation. I've been working with a geneticist, Victor martinez Gless, And Victor has sequenced uh, DNA collected from affected and unaffected tissue from patients. And through that work, he identified somatic activating mutations in PIK3CA in five out of nine GLA patients. So PIK3CA, is the catalytic subunit of PI3 kinase. And the somatic activating mutations that Victor identified are known disease-causing mutations. So these mutations cause hyperactivation of the AKT and mTOR signaling pathway. So to characterize the effect of excessive PI3 kinase signaling on the development and structure of lymphatics, we have used the Cree lock system to express an uh, active form of PIK3CA in lymphatic endothelium. And we have used the Prox1 Cree mouse developed by Guillermo Oliver to induce the expression of an H1047R active form of PIK3CA. So our PIK3CA mouse has a lock stop lock sequence upstream of the mutant version of PIK3CA. So Cree-mediated recombination results in the expression of this mutant version of PIK3CA in lymphatic endothelium. So to induce the expression of PIK3CA in lymphatic endothelium, we injected mice with tamoxifen. We then collected tissues from mice either four or eight weeks after they received their last tamoxifen injection. And what we're looking at here are ear skin hole mounts, which have been stained with an anti live one antibody. We found that the lymphatic network in our control animals appeared normal, whereas the lymphatic network in our mutant animals appeared hyperplastic. So these results show that excessive PI3 kinase signaling in lymphatic endothelial cells can promote or cause lymphatic hyperplasia. In addition to analyzing soft tissues from our mice, we also analyzed hard tissue and bone. 
What we're looking at here are femurs from control and mutant animals. These femurs have been stained with an anti-Live1 antibody. You can see that there are no lymphatic vessels in the bone from the control animal. In contrast, lymphatic vessels are present in the bone from the mutant animal. And we've confirmed that these vessels are lymphatic vessels by staining for additional markers of lymphatic endothelium. We found that control mice do not have podoplanin positive vessels in their bone. In contrast, our mutant animals do have podoplanin positive lymphatic vessels in their bone. So these data show that excessive PI3 kinase signaling in lymphatic endothelium can promote the formation of ectopic lymphatics in bone. Although our mutant animals have lymphatics in bone, their bones appear normal on x-ray. And this could be because at this time point, the mice do not have a lot of lymphatics in bone. So the greatest number of lymphatics we've observed in an in individual bone has been 10. So what we're working on doing now is collecting bones from older mice to see if this phenotype becomes more severe with age. In addition to assessing the structure of the lymphatic network in our control and mutant animals, we also assess the function of the lymphatic network. And in this experiment, we injected the hind paws of mice with Evans blue dye. And Evans blue dye is picked up and transported by lymphatic vessels. In our control mice, we found that all the iliac lymph nodes filled with Evans blue dye. That indicates that the lymphatic network is functioning. In contrast, iliac lymph nodes in our mutant animals did not fill with Evans blue dye. So these results show that excessive PI3 kinase signaling in lymphatic endothelial cells impairs lymphatic function. So somatic activating mutations in PIK3CA cause hyperactivation of the PI3 kinase AKT and mTOR pathway. Rapamycin is an FDA approved inhibitor of mTOR. Therefore, we set out to determine the effect of rapamycin on the phenotype of our mutant animals. We first performed a prevention study. And in this experiment, mice were, we started to treat mice with either vehicle or rapamycin a day after they received their last tamoxifen injection. And we treated mice with rapamycin for four weeks. And we found that in this setting, rapamycin could prevent lymphatic hyperplasia. We also assessed lymphatic function in these mice, and we found that iliac lymph nodes in vehicle-treated mice did not fill with Evans blue dye, so these lymphatics did not function. In contrast, iliac lymph nodes in rapamycin-treated mice did fill with Evans blue dye, which indicates that the lymphatic network is functioning. So together, these results show that rapamycin can prevent lymphatic hyperplasia and lymphatic dysfunction when given early. We then performed an intervention study. And in this experiment, we let mice develop the disease and then we treated them with either vehicle or rapamycin. So in this experiment, we, let, we injected mice with tamoxifen. We then let the mice age for four weeks. And during that time, the lymphatic network becomes hyperplastic and dysfunctional. We then started to treat mice with vehicle or rapamycin and we treated them for three weeks. And we found that in this setting, rapamycin could attenuate lymphatic hyperplasia in our mutant animals. We also assessed lymphatic function in these mice. And we found that uh, iliac lymph nodes in vehicle-treated mice did not fill with Evans blue dye. And amazingly, iliac lymph nodes in 9 out of 11 rapamycin-treated mice filled with Evans blue dye. So we were able to partially restore lymphatic function uh, in mice by treating them with rapamycin. So these data suggest that rapamycin could potentially normalize lymphatic function in mutant animals. In addition to treating mice with rapamycin, I've been working with Juan Carlos Lopez Gutierrez, and he has treated four GLA patients that have PIK3CA mutations with rapamycin.
And so far, the greatest response that these patients have reported has been a reduction in pain. And I wanna say that our findings are in agreement with a few case reports where GLA patients have been treated with rapamycin. And these patients have reported a reduction in pain. And also some patients have reported a resolution of their pleural effusion or their chylothorax, which also suggests that rapamycin can normalize lymphatic function. I just wanna point out that although these patients have been treated with rapamycin, there was really no molecular rationale for treating these patients with rapamycin. And we were the first to show that the mTOR signaling pathway is altered in these patients. So to summarize what I've shown during this part of the talk, we have found that some GLA patients have somatic activating mutations in PIK3CA. We've shown that excessive PI3 kinase signaling in lymphatic endothelial cells can cause lymphatic hyperplasia and dysfunction in mice. We also show that excessive PI3 kinase signaling in lymphatic endothelial cells leads to the formation of ectopic lymphatics in bone. We found that rapamycin can prevent lymphatic hyperplasia and dysfunction uh, when given to mice early. And we've also found that rapamycin can normalize lymphatic function in mice with established disease. And we provide additional evidence which shows that GLA patients can respond to rapamycin and we really provide the molecular rationale for treating GLA patients with rapamycin. So for our future directions on this project, We've obtained PIK3CA mutant lymphatic endothelial cells with my, uh, from a patient. This, these cells have a H1047L mutation. And we've been performing a battery of in vitro assays with these cells, and I just wanted to show one. This is the fibrin bead assay. And in this assay, beads are coated with endothelial cells, and then the beads are implanted in a fibrin gel. And in this assay, you can see the normal lymphatic endothelial cells form normal appearing vessels, whereas the PIK3CA mutant lymphatic endothelial cells form these irregular hyperplastic vessels, similar to what we see in vivo. So we're currently performing a number of omics experiments with these cells, and we're also trying various therapies with these cells. And we hope to develop a better understanding of the mechanism by which PI3 kinase signaling promotes lymphatic hyperplasia. So to conclude, we have developed two animal models for lymphatic anomalies with bone involvement. These animal models will help us develop a better understanding of the pathophysiology of lymphatic anomalies with bone involvement. And we think that our animal models will assist in identifying new biomarkers and therapies for GLA and GSD. I would just like to acknowledge the people in my lab that have worked on this project. Uh, Devin was instrumental in both projects and she's gonna be helping with the questions here in a little bit. Um, I'd like to acknowledge Kerry Alitalo. He helped uh, the he gave us the Tet Veg FC mouse and helped us get the Gorm Stout animal model off the ground. Bronick Patowski at Eli Lilly gave us the Veg FR2 and Veg FR3 inhibitors. And Victor Martinez Glez has, uh, is the one that identified the PIK3CA mutations in the GLA patients. And Juan Carlos Lopez Gutierrez has been uh, treating GLA and GSD patients for years. I'd also like to acknowledge my funding from the Foster Family Foundation the Lymphatic Malformation Institute, and the Department of Surgery at UT Southwestern. Thank you for your attention, and I think we're gonna answer questions now. Thank you so much, Thank you Dr. So much, Dr. Dr. I see that we I have, see that we have questions. questions. No, no. We do? Uh, uh, Dr. Hominick, Dr. Do, we Dr. Hominick do we have questions? I don't see any right now. All right. All right. Does anyone Oh, anyone? I see a hand. Oh, see a hand. Uh, maybe we can move maybe on we can to the uh, verbal questions. Verbal questions. 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 Um, can we unmute can we David? David? Uh, Vija? Vija? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yep. Very nice talk, Very Mike. Nice talk, Mike. Um, I have I two have questions, questions, and I, I hope they're related. 
first when when you were talking about the the findings near the end of your talk about the uh, double transgenics with the VEGFC modulation and the changes in the bone structure. You also mentioned that they develop chylothorax. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Do you have any idea about how the chylothorax is coming about? Yeah, so when we overexpress VEGFC in bone, we stimulate the formation of lymphatics in bone, but we also cause the lymphatics in the muscle to become abnormal. And we've done Evans blue dye injections, and we can see that these that the Evans blue dye goes from the thoracic duct and it fills these irregular lymphatics that are present in the muscle. And we can see it leaking uh, from those irregular lymphatics. So we think that's where the chyle is coming from. Okay, that's was that was my guess is what you were gonna tell me. But the next question then might might be related is have you then evaluated in your uh, uh PI PIK 3CA LEC modulated uh, LECs, if they've ever done, have you ever done any permeability assays with them to see if that modulates the permeability in a fashion that would potentially be involved with your uh, chylothorax? We haven't done that, but those mice also develop a pleural effusion too and, uh, and, and die as a result of it. So there's definitely going on, something going on. Um, in terms of leakiness with those lymphatics. Yeah, that would make but sense. We, have, we, we haven't done a permeability assay, but I'd love to actually uh, talk to you again after this about sure. um, doing some more work with that. So these yeah. mice. And of course, you know, you know, my other question is going to be about, do you know if it modulates the collecting vessel function that you, those nice vessels you talked about early on, but then didn't come back and touch again? Yeah, so we haven't done a detailed analysis of the collecting vessels. Uh, most of our work, we've been focusing on the dermal lymphatics and the lymphatic capillaries. We've really investigated those, but we haven't really dug into the collecting vessels yet. Okay. All right. Thanks. Very nice talk. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for more questions. Does anyone else want to ask a question? I can ask a question on the meantime, so maybe those of you who are still thinking about it or a little bit shy have some more time to come back with questions for Dr. Dellinger. My question is um, related to the GSD disease. Do the patients with DSG express high levels of VGFC in their bone marrow? So it hasn't been measured in, in bone. Uh, what people have looked at are circulating levels of VGFC. And so far, VEGFC does not be elevated in serum from patients, but it hasn't been explored whether or not it's locally elevated. And one of the challenges is, is that bone samples from, from patients are frequently uh, decalcified with acid and then embedded in paraffin, and that makes some of the molecular work a little bit more challenging. Um, so we haven't looked in frozen samples from patients to determine whether VEGFC is locally elevated. Because that would be really interesting since it seems that you need like a local growth factor or maintenance factor to keep the lymphatics in there, at least in your mouse model. We don't know how mm -hmm. it may be for humans. And, and, and also in the other model, we, we with the PIC3CA, we're activating a pathway. Um, so VEGFC actually activates PI3 kinase signaling in lymphatic endothelial cells. But that so seems one to be more the possibility is that it may be ligand independent, right? Because it seems like it's mm -hmm. an activating mutation. Mm -hmm. uh, I, following up with that question, in your double mutants where you overexpress VJFC, how do you see the blood vessels? Because VJFC, it's fundamentally um, a lymphatic um, angiogenic agent, but it also triggers the increase of blood vessels. How are the blood vessels in your mouse model? Are they also abnormal or are they relatively healthy? When you look uh, near the trabecular bone in these animals, you can see some blood vessel abnormalities. Um, but as you move away to the bone marrow, uh, further down the bone, the blood vessels look normal. Um, so around the trabecular bone or at the ends of the bone, we can see some irregularities with the blood vessels. Um, but as you move away from the ends of the bone, the blood vessels look normal. And GSD and GLA patients, do they have any abnormalities on blood vessels or is it restricted to lymphatic vessels? 
Well, actually, the, the Gorham and Stout, their first paper, they said hemangiomatosis. Um, <laughs> so, or angiomatosis. So, it, it, they didn't have the luxury of having immunohistochemical markers of lymphatic endothelium. And they said in some patients, it appeared as though the blood vessels were abnormal. Uh, whereas in other patients, they thought they observed lymphatic vessels. Um, since the use, since since immunohistochemical markers have come to play, we can see that there are lymphatics, ectopic lymphatics in bone, and these these bones are these lymphatics are irregular. With respect to the blood vessels, I, people really haven't gone back to uh, talk about if there are irregularities with these blood vessels. Also, it'd be hard to sort of rule determine whether or not if there are changes. Are they primary or secondary um, to the changes that are occurring in the bone? Yeah, that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, does anyone else have another question? I don't see any hands raised, but let me double check. No hands. Well, um, if there are no other questions, uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Dellinger and Dr. Hominick for being there in case we had some written questions. Um, if you have any further questions that you didn't think now, but you want to ask later, you can email um, us at navo at info at navo.org and we'll forward the question to Dr. Dellinger or you can email Dr. Dellinger himself. I'm sure he'll be glad to hear from you and ask, answer any questions you have. Um, that you enjoyed the webinar. And uh, these webinars are brought to you by the NAVO Education Committee, which um, thought the session a uh, cutting edge technology um, to analyze um, splicing sensitive platforms such as single cell and bulk RNA seq data may also be of interest. So we are pleased to be covering this on our next webinar. So please join us on September 13th when Dr. Nathan Solomones of the Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center will present his research entitled Fast Interactive Genomics Data Visualization in Alt Analyze. Alt Analyze? Yeah, I just said it right. So thank you very much all for being here and for your attention. Please fill out the evaluation form at the end of the webinar or when you receive it in a subsequent email and let us know what you thought about the webinar and any topics that you may want to see at the NAVO webinar presentation. Have a fantastic day. Hello?